Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Michael Rugel from the National Museum of American Jewish Military History. It's a real pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Leah Garrett, the author of X Troop Secret Jewish Commandos of World War II. We do this as part of our Alan S. Brown Scholar Series. Alan S. Brown proudly served his country for 23 years as a U.S. Naval officer and was a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. We present these talks in memory of his dedication to community and education. Uh, it's great to be here with Leah, and, and uh, I'll just start off saying right away, uh, the extra book is, is fascinating. I want to urge everyone to go out and buy it. We understand we're at a pivotal time for, for book sales when the stores are determining whether to keep it on the shelves or not. So go ahead and buy it uh, now and buy, buy it this week. Uh, we will take questions at the end, and I'll ask people to use the Q&A fu function. The Q&A button is at the, the bottom of your screen. And you can go ahead and start sum submitting questions uh, whenever you like, but we'll, we'll definitely get to them at the end. Uh, I think I first uh, became aware of, of Leah Garrett when their first book, Young Lions, uh, came out. And I, I think I've reached out, try, hoping that Leah could give a talk at the museum about Young Lions. It's a, Young Lions is a really good book uh, about the Jewish World War II veterans who went on to write the great uh, American war novels, Norman Mailer, Joseph Heller, uh, Leon Uris, and when I first got in touch, uh, Leah was in Australia, and so we couldn't make a talk work out right away, which is now baffling. Why, why did I care that she was in Australia? We could have just uh, done this, but at the time, we were, we were not in that mindset, and uh, fortunately, uh, we eventually took the job as the, as the director for director of Jewish studies at Hunter College, who so have the, the title right, mm -hmm. and was in New York, and we got her down, uh, down to D.C. one weekend, and she gave a talk about Young Lions, which was which was fascinating. Uh, go ahead and buy that one too, but buy uh, X Troop first. Uh, and at the time, I think you, had, you told me that you were working on uh, the X Troop book. And it's, at that point, I think maybe I'd heard the the the, the word, the name X Troop, but but didn't know you know anything beyond. That. I think maybe I'd seen like a reference in a Martin Sugarman article or something along those lines. But uh, you know, it it, it was uh, not something that meant a lot to me, um, but it's really uh, an amazing story. And we're talking about the British military as opposed to the American military that we uh, usually talk about as a museum, but this is a, a story along the lines similar to a lot of ones. I was actually looking back at the talks uh, we've done in the past couple of years, and we've had a fair number of stuff about German Jewish refugees. Uh, Eric Lichtblau gave a talk on uh, Freddie Mayer, who was a uh, a refugee who came and joined the army and ends up going back as an OSS spy and uh, parachutes onto this uh, glacier in Austria where he's supposed to ski down and ends up posing as a Nazi officer for, for weeks at a time. Uh, we've done some stuff on, on the Ritchie boys, the, uh, the men who were men and women who were trained in intelligence at Camp Ritchie, Maryland. A lot of them were turning back to Europe to interrogate uh, POWs and do other intelligence tasks. Uh, we had Michael Guerin discussing what happened to the uh, German Jewish World War I veterans. And we're gonna have another upcoming talk on one of those, a guy named Richard Stern, who was a uh, Silver Star recipient with, with the German army in World War I and comes to the US and enlists in World War II in his 40s and, and earns a Silver Star fighting in Italy. So there's all these amazing stories about these uh, German Jewish refugees, but, but none of these are quite like extra. Uh, there's, some, there's some key differences. And so it's really excited to have Leah here. So let's go ahead and just get started off. What, what was X Troop? Uh, thanks, Mike. And thanks so much for having me. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here. So I had this extraordinary moment about three years ago when I too had heard rumors about the secret Jewish commando unit. And I went to buy the book and thought, oh my God, there's no book on these guys. Oh my God, I get to write this book. So um, it is an extraordinary unknown story of World War II that's hopefully now getting to be known. Um, and basically the X Troop were a secret Jewish commando unit of the British military. They were comprised of German and Austrian refugees from the Holocaust. The majority of them were young men who came by themselves to England when the war broke out on kinder transport. Um, when their parents faced that impossible decision, knowing that basically all that they could do uh, was send their kids away because nobody was taking the Jews anymore. So these scores of these young men arrive in England. They do okay for the first few years until the war breaks out. And when the war breaks out, Winston Churchill decides um, in a large measure, because there was a lot of sort of um, 
xenophobic press at this point about um, others within our midst that they would set up internment camps for, um, for some of the German refugees, majority of course who are Jewish, right? So the ex-troopers start their, their story in England in internment camps in the United Kingdom. Some are sent to Australia, some are sent to Canada. It's, it's rough and terrible. I interviewed still living commandos for the book who talked about the internment. And then, when the war is underway by 1942, it's pretty clear to the, Eng the English that things are not going their way. And Churchill meets with Lord Montbatten and they decide together that they're gonna create a new commando unit unlike anything that's existed before. It's gonna be comprised of German speakers. Unlike the Ritchie boys who are going to be counterintelligence officers, these guys are gonna be commandos and counterintelligence officers. So they're gonna be trained both to kill and capture Nazis, to be right at the tip of the spear in all the battles, and then to interrogate them on the field to get important intelligence for that moment, to know where are the mines laid, what are the Germans up to, and then they can continue on the battle. So it was uh, not, nothing like this had ever existed before. They end up going to the Pioneer Corps to find them because when these German Jews were interred, they were given the opportunity to leave internment by joining the Pioneer Corps, which was a non-combat unit where they build bridges. And, and I'll show pictures later that will give you a sense of it. Um, and then their commanding officers are told to look for the best and the brightest. And they find the best and the brightest. They send them to England. They interview them with, with MI5. And um, the men who are selected are the elite of the elite. And not only this, like when I was writing the book, it was like in Passover where you keep saying, Dianu, are you kidding me? Every story was more amazing than the last. I mean, when I start to tell you about what they did in World War II, you won't even, it's hard to believe how crucial they were. But when they're finally selected, a, a really important part of the story is because the German um, Germans, if any of these guys are caught, will kill them because they're Jews, they'll kill them because they're Germans, they'll kill them because they're commandos. They're all given about five minutes to come up with a fake British name, fake British persona. They're given Church of England dog tags. So those who are killed in, uh, in war buried under crosses. And, um, and all of them go through this extraordinary transformation from these German and Austrian Jewish refugees of the Holocaust who are all losing their families to the, to the war to these British commandos who become the most fierce and important commandos in World War II. Let's go back to the internment camps because that was pretty stunning to me to read about that the, the enemy alien concept existed here in the US too. It, um, but it took the form of you know some guys not being able to enlist. There, there seems to have been in the early months of the war that then they send some of the German Jews to the Pacific rather than to Europe because of the enemy alien concept, but nothing approaching internment camps. So the British thinking was just that Germans were Germans and the uh, Nazis they captured were the same as the German Jews? Yeah, so the British thinking was that Germans were Germans. I mean, I went through, I did huge amounts of archival research for this book and there, it was never sort of said or suggested it's because they're, you know, there wasn't an anti-Semitic aspect to it overtly, but subconsciously, I mean, if they had thought about it for 10 minutes, they would have realized at that point that 85% of the German refugees are Jews, right? So when they start to sit up, they start decide that they're gonna set up these panels to kind of figure out whether or not they can trust these German refugees. And so the vast majority of them, they do not inter. The vast majority of them, you know, are women or married or have kids, but young men on their own are considered a very deep security risk, potentially a fifth column. Um, and those are the ones who get interned. And because all of the ex-troopers, well, most of the ex-troopers are young German Jews who came by themselves on kinder transport a few years before all this, um, they end up being the majority who, the majority, almost every single ex-trooper ends up getting interned. The internment camps in the UK were bad, but not horrific, um, but they were okay. But, you know, they were still, as they said, behind barbed wire. Um, the main was one was on the Isle of Man. But then the British made this extremely strange decision that they would also send a bunch of these, again, traumatized Holocaust men um, over to Australia and Canada. And that's sort of one of the darkest stories I tell in the book 
which is a bunch of them are sent on something called the Daenerys ship, which is basically a voyage of the damned where the, the, the crew unfortunately is, is a, a very anti-Semitic British commanding officer of the crew and the men are completely brutalized. Um, all of, all of the, the people on the ship will eventually get court-martialed. But I mean, for these men, then they're sent to Australia and then they're put in an internment camp in the middle of the outback for a year. And what the men said to a person about what was hardest about all of this was they were cut off from the news. That was really hard. So they didn't know how the war was going. They had no idea what was happening in Europe. And for all of them, because this war was completely personal, because they knew that the clock was ticking um, and that they had to win this war to save their families, that was the hardest aspect. I'm gonna turn on the light, by the way, because we're having huge thunderstorms and there's no more natural light coming in here. So let me just turn on the light. It's very dark in here. Yeah, thanks. So everybody uh, uh, be aware if we, if we lose internet connections because of these severe thunderstorms in New York. I will call back. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Thank you. Yeah, so, so uh, the next stop for, for some of these guys is, is the Pioneer Corps. And you can describe what's that like and what, and for people, so motivated to go off and fight the Nazis. How, how what was that right. experience like? Yeah, so the Pioneer Corps was for many of them actually the most frustrating part of the war. Because when I wrote the book, I, I got really lucky on the research because when I realized it hadn't been written, I got in touch with all the families I could find on commandos, all of whom were so generous. They shared their dad's diaries and photos and and then I found the Holocaust Museum in DC had a couple of good archives. So I went there. I went to Kew in the UK to go through all the war diaries because whatever I wrote about, I had to make sure that, you know, a lot of these men were interviewed in the 80s that what they said matched the war diaries that talked about the events of the war. And what I kept finding out about the Pioneer Corps was just utter and complete frustration by these young men because they were not given arms, they were not allowed to fight, they were sent to build bridges. And these again were the best and the brightest. They were smart, they were capable, they were determined, they wanted to fight and kill Nazis and nobody was letting them do it. And all of them were constantly agitating Please, please get me into a real service, please. But eventually by 1942, um, they, the war offices changed their mind. One of the men who's interviewed in, who was interviewed in, um, Whoa. Big lightning. Um, <laughs> okay, at least we're still connected. One of the men um, said that he, that I, I, his daughter shared his memoir with me. And he said it was the most absurd, absurd thing in the, in the world when he was interviewed for the X Troop. He said, I went into the office being interviewed by MI5, not being trusted to carry anything more dangerous than a shovel. And then I'm being told I'm gonna to be an elite commando. What young man doesn't like that? <laughs> so were there specific uh, things that, that affected the, the British policy to go from these guys need to be in camp to that they need to be the elite of the army or was it just a well, general realization? They there was a realization by the war office that there were there were a number of different um, uh, uh, refugees. There were Belgian refugees, there were French refugees. And so what they decided they would do was create something called inter-allied 10 commando, right? And that would be made of all these different, there'd be a French troop, there would be, you know, there'd be all the, a Polish troop. And so that was created. And the idea for all those troops was that these guys would have a burning desire to go save their countries from the Nazis. But then what happened was they realized, wow, it'd be really extraordinary if we actually got German speakers, because if we got German speakers, it means that we can have them do counterintelligence on the battlefield. So we, like I said, they can kill and capture Nazis and they can interrogate them. So it's kind of, it's sort of ironic, but the the X troop, so there's the an inter-allied 10, 10 commando, like I said, there's the Polish troop, it's called the Polish troop, Belgian troop, French troop, and for the ex-troopers, again, who are all German and Austrian Jews, it's called the British troop, which is ridiculous because, not, I mean, they were all pretending to be British. They all had these accents. They all had to create fake backstories about why they had British accents. So they were officially called the British troop. So nobody knew about their existence, by the way, until after the war. And then very few people did. I had to declassify a lot of files to write this book. There's a scene that you describe where they're, they're told, hey, you need a new name and a new identity, and they're, and they're coming up with, can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, so 
like I said, these guys, I mean, they've gone through hell on earth, right? They've lost their families to the Holocaust. They've come to the UK. They think they're safe. Now they're being interned. All of this stuff is happening. Then they're sent to the Pioneer Corps, right? So it's been so hard, but they're so determined, these guys, and so focused. All they want to do is be able to fight the Nazis, right? So finally, Finally, they're like I said, their commanding officers in the Pioneer Corps listen to them and they pick them and say, look, you can go and be interviewed for this thing. So they're finally selected to be in something. They don't know what it is, but they know it's really important and they're told it's a really important commando unit. They're put on, um, they're put on in this line in front of their commanding officer, who's this incredible man I'll show a photo of later, a, a Welsh officer, Brian Hilton Jones. And he says, as they line up, he says, okay, when you come in, I wanna know your new name and I wanna know your backstory. And as each of them walk in the room, like they're given that much time, they have to come up with a name. So one of the men I focus on, Colin Anson, his original name is Klaus Ascher. He's a German Jew. His dad has been killed at Dachau. He's standing online and he hears an Anson, Anson plane fly over him. And so when he walks in, he says, I'll be Colin Anson. And, and Brian Hill Jones says, yeah, that sounds good. And he also has a, um, he has a, a, a book of like, a, like a telephone directory type thing in front of him. So as they go in, they're given the new names and then he has to give them all fake regiments too. So they're all given fake regiments as well. Fake, you know, fake um, symbols that they have to wear. And, um, and that's who they become. That's who they were. And the majority of them end up keeping their names after the war because they, yeah. Yeah, so there's almost split second decisions and that's the rest of their life. That their and their kids are their names. A very few of the grandchildren, like it, that, that's the name that they become and their families become and their grandchildren become and their great grandchildren will become. Yeah, yeah. So there's this tradition of, of immigrants changing their name, but under circumstances yeah. like that, that's pretty unique. It's uh, yeah. And he said, Brian Hill and Jones at one point says, them, "Don't all call yourselves Monty." I mean, because they all like, can you imagine? Like they had to come up with this very British-sounding name, right? As they're sounding there, like James Clifford or whatever it is. Yeah, and they do. They do all have the the, the British-sounding names. It's a, yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a, it comes through. Uh, so they go on to training in, in Wales, and it's kind of this really intense uh, training. Yeah, so the Wales training, and I hope, I'm only, by the way, I should say, like, I'm covering so little of the book, please do purchase the book, because the stories are wild in it, like, I'm giving you the tip of the iceberg, but um, when they're in Wales, I mean, again, can you imagine, these are, like, often very cultured Viennese Jews, you know, they come from artistic families, parents are, like, publishers and writers, and suddenly, because they're commandos, they're told that they, Commandos at that point don't have their own, they don't have their own dorms. They're billeted with locals. So they're all given a few bucks and said, walk around this village and find yourself in somewhere to stay. And so then, I mean, it's just so crazy. So then they go to these different houses, they have a little pay stub and they end up living with Welsh families for a year, except for some of them go, go off early and go to Sicily. Um, but the rest of them stay there till D-Day, till the Landies. Some of them do missions before. And so they're living with Welsh families, right? In a little teeny town called Aberdovey is what it was called then, on the coast, very rural, pretending to have British backstories. None of them can talk about what's happened to them. All of them are told, burn your, well, don't burn, hide, burn your books that have your names on them, hide your letters, we're gonna put everything into safety. So they're stripped bare of everything they have from their past, but, they, to a man, are psyched to do this. Man for Gans, who I write about in the book, um, he comes, I write a lot about him in the book. He came from an Orthodox Jewish family in Germany. Do you hear that? Yeah, it's, it's coming through loud and clear. There's some big storms in New York. <laughs> um, he's in an Orthodox Jew Jewish family in Germany. And, um, and he is, he, unlike most of them, is actually a religious Jew. Most of them are pretty secular, from pretty secular families. And when I wrote the first draft of the book, I wrote a lot about how hard this transformation was as I perceived it to be for him. I had tons of material on him, archival, tons of material, but I kept thinking, God, this must have been really hard because he knew he couldn't practice Judaism. He knew, like, on Yom Kippur, he would have to eat. Like, he knew what this meant. And I shared the book with his family before it went to publication because I became very close with a lot of the kids. And they said, 
man, it was hard, but it was so worth it for him. So when I rewrote the book the second time, the second draft, I, I, I realized I needed to make it much clearer that it was all worth it. This was all worth it for them because these guys got to go capture and kill Nazis. I mean, like one of them said, what young man wouldn't want to do that, especially a Jewish man. So the book, as, it, as I wrote it, you would think it would be like a hard, difficult story of World War II and the Holocaust, which it is, but it's incredibly optimistic because all of them get their agency back and fight on the front lines and are totally crucial to the allied war effort. So for him, the transformation was probably the hardest just because he went, he was religious, but it really wasn't because he knew that's it. Now I get to, now I get to, now I get to go fight the Nazis so I can try and save my parents who are still hiding out over there. So things uh, don't get off to such a great start with the raid at Dieppe. Right. Um, yeah, so the first iteration of the X Troop was at Dieppe. Um, and Dieppe, for most of you know, was a terrible catastrophe of the war. The numbers of Canadian soldiers who were killed, it was a complete fiasco. But what I discovered in writing the book was that some scholars a few years ago had written about um, that Dieppe was potentially a cover for um, the Brits to try and steal an Enigma machine um, to declassify what the Germans were up to. And decode. all of the, yeah, all the, to decode what the Germans were actually doing when they were like bombing British ships and stuff like that. Um, and I found all of this top secret information that's in the book um, that suggests that actually a bunch of ex troopers were sent to. Um, Dieppe in order to um, try and snatch an Enigma machine. But because Dieppe was such a catastrophe for everybody of the five ex troopers who are sent, only one comes back unscathed. Um, and he ends up being, I'll have a picture of him later, really crucial in the ex troop. But the good part for the ex troop about Dieppe was that Brian Hilton Jones was still the commanding officer. And after Dieppe, he thought, I am going to do whatever it takes to train these boys. So they are unbeatable. So th as, as intense as the training was going to be, after Dieppe, it was twice as intense. So they end up serving not, not as a unit, but they're, they're, they're sent to other, other British units and, and attached to other uh, yes. various operations. Yeah, so, so another very strange aspect about the X Troop was, again, this had never, this had never, I wrote down the word to describe this term, because um, my brother-in-law is in British military. He said it's called a forced multiplier, which is a military term that I didn't know about until a few weeks ago. These were the first forced multipliers. And what that means is that quickly, the British War Office, when they're watching these boys be trained at Wales, starts to realize, wow, these guys are incredible. They are so physically capable. They're so smart. They're so adept we cannot risk sending them out as their own unit. So the French troop are sent as their own unit, the Polish troop, not the X troop. The X troop instead is seconded in groups of two to four to existing commando units. So when D-Day happens, um, there's two to four of them in each of the commando landing units, because the idea was that these guys, again, like I said earlier, would be the tip of the spear and they would fight in every different commando unit. And so what they would have with these two to four ex troopers in each of the units was, as I said, somebody who's fluent in German, somebody who is incredibly determined, someone who has insane training in counterintelligence and somebody who is gonna take all the riskiest missions. And Peter Masters wrote in his book about, he wrote an autobiography about it um, and he said, where other soldiers and commandos were drawing straws to see who stayed behind, we were the guys drawing straws to see who got to do the riskiest mission. So they were, I, I got an email from a guy um, last week. He said, um, he said, these make all the other counterintelligence um, people seem like Boy Scouts because they were counterintelligence and commandos. And, and of course, yeah. fighting to liberate their countries. Yeah, most most people had more specific jobs in intelligence work, and this combination is, is really makes it yeah. very special. Uh, so, what were what were some of the uh, the raids and missions prior to prior to D Day that they went on? Can you describe um, some of them? So, some of the raids and missions, they were a bunch of them were sent to Sicily, and um, I write about in the book like a whole group of them who go there. It's really interesting. Um, 
and who are on the first um, landing craft at Sicily and then make their way up and they do really crucial stuff, which you can read about. Um, a bunch of them are sent on missions across enemy lines, some of them who don't come back. And I still don't know, I know that where they go missing, like in Yugoslavia, but I don't have the details on those because that stuff is still um, highly classified. Um, one of the most extraordinary um, of them though is George Lane, who I'll show a photo of later. Um, and George Lane, I write a whole chapter about this incredible mission. So right be before the D-Day landing, the British get intelligence that suggests that the Germans have a new type of mine that they've put along the Normandy coast. And the high office decides that we cannot do D-Day until we find out what that mine is like because it might blow up all our ships. We don't know what it is. And so Brian Hilton Jones, who's in charge of the X troop, selects this guy named George Lane, again, a Jew who's pretending to be British, but one thing that's great about um, George Lane is he was a finalist on the Hungarian Olympic polo team. So he's a really good swimmer. So he sends him on a raft, him and one other guy on a raft, and they're given the mission to land at Normandy before D-Day and literally get one of the mines and bring them back. God only knows, right? So he goes on the first mission. He's highly skilled. He looks, he does diving. He says, this is not a secret mine. This is a standard teller mine. He goes back and he tells them it's a standard teller mine. They don't believe him. They send him back a second time. He does it again, goes back. They send him a third time. Um, and the third time that he goes to, to get the intel, he's actually captured. And I describe this in the book and he has this incredible encounter with Rommel himself. Um, but and you can read about it in the book, but what's really extraordinary about George Lane is I read his military citation because he got a military medal after this. And it literally says, but for what George Lane did, D-Day would not have happened as planned because his intelligence from the first two day told them they could do the landing. And like I said, Dayenu, like every, every place these guys are in war, they do things like this. They find this really crucial intelligence they get it back to base, um, and then and then it, it impacts on the on the war in the next minutes, days, etc. And I will show photos in a bit to kind of so people can see. But the book is packed with photos as well of these guys. Yeah, so people should get the book for the first story. But I will say, of all the uh, unlikely things in the book, it, it, it maybe George Lane, this Hungarian Jew, having tea with the German field marshal. That was a, a it was amazing story. Yeah, and also you know George Lane. He was married to Mar Marion Rothschild at this point, um, and she was working at, working at Bletchley Park. I mean, all of these ties are incredible. Um, but he knew he knew that when he was being interviewed, like uh, remember he's undercover, right? So nobody can know who he is. So he makes the decision that he's going to pretend that his English accent is Welsh, and he's going to talk with this really weird Welsh accent and pretend he's Welsh, so that they won't realize that it's actually a German accent when he's speaking English. And he's successful. They do not. I don't know if they don't suss out that he's a commando or that Rommel is so charmed with this guy, but he has tea with Rommel and he talks about the treatment of the Jews and Rommel doesn't realize that this so-called Welsh, you know, Welsh guy is actually um, a Budapest Jew. Hmm. Uh, so you mentioned D-Day, that, that seems to be like kind of when it all comes together, the various forms of training and gathering intelligence and, and fighting and everything happens uh, in, you know, the signed missions. Um, you could share some some of the stories of some of the, I know Peter Ambassador showed up on a bicycle. So that, that was an interesting. Yeah, uh, amazing. Um, yeah, and I'll show a photo of that later. So Peter Masters um, is one of the men, I, I, I tell the whole story of the troop, but then I focus in detail, very deep detail on three and larger detail on about eight of them. And he's one of the three. He's incredible. He comes from this Viennese Jewish family, very cultured, um, has a bar mitzvah, but they're fairly secular and he decides he want, he really wants to be an artist is what he wants to be. And after the war, he becomes actually a very important artist. And I have, I have some of his paintings in the book. Um, and so he set, like I said, with all these different commando units and as the, as the boys are going down to Southampton to get the boats over to the landing, one of the ex troopers comes up to him and says, hey, you wanna go with the, with the bicycle troop? And he says, sure. 
what's that? And it turns out that there's this special troop of men. By the way, these other bicycle troopers have been training for six months together, like seriously have been training on how do you do. He's basically gets the bike to ride down to the boat, right? And they're these very clunky, heavy, awful bikes. But the idea with the bikes is that when these boys land, and I have a photo I'll show you of their landing, they will be the ones who carry their bikes onto shore, put them together, because they're foldable, they don't have pedals or anything. Um, and by the way, another commando on a different ship, when he saw the guys with the bikes, he said, I cannot imagine anything worse to land on in world uh, on D-Day than with a bike. So it was like, it wasn't a great gift, but the idea was that these guys would ride their bikes straight ahead, where, again, like this is the craziness of this book because it hits all of the big moments to Pegasus Bridge, to get to Pegasus Bridge, which we all know was this crucial bridge um, that the allies had to hold to beat the Germans. And so he lands up on the beach, puts his bike together with the, with the other members of the bicycle troop. And while being shot at, these boys with Peter Masters, this Viennese Jew right at the front, ride straight to Pegasus Bridge and um, and are the first ones over the bridge. Unbelievable. And I have I read all these letters between him and Lord Lovett, who was kind of the larger person in charge of his commando unit, talking about the fact, I mean, like, who, like they thought it was just this British guy, but again, the sense of determination. And so for Normandy, these guys are just absolutely crucial, capturing positions, fighting for them, being at the forefront. Um, because as I said, and I write the book, the, I don't think the, I think the book, it doesn't read as history, it reads as like popular history, though it's all archived. I've, it's like, it's a narrative history. Um, but what I talk about over and over again, and I'll keep saying it, is that the war was personal. They had to beat the Nazis. There was not a minute to lose because they had to get there to rescue their mothers or sisters or children before the Nazis did if there were any left. So everything was about fighting, winning, determination, getting intelligence, moving forward. So a lot of these guys must have had family either, either killed or still surviving in concentration camps. Yeah, um, so the majority of them um, lost their parents. A number of them um, managed, maybe a couple people survive. I tell the story in the book, um, which is probably the most extraordinary story I've ever written about in my entire life about, um, and you can read in the book because it's, I sort of want to give it back to him. It's in his own words. It was based on his diary, um, which is at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum of Monfred Gans, the Orthodox Jew I talked about from Bork in Germany, who ends up being so crucial in the war. And while the war is happening, he keeps getting updates on his parents who are in hiding. He hears they're in Bergen-Belsen. And eventually in the final stages of the war, he hears that they're in Terzenstadt concentration camp. And honestly, he, I, it's hard to describe the journey he makes, but he makes an epic journey in the final days of the war, all true through apocalyptic war-torn Germany um, and then to Czechoslovakia to rescue his parents. And I'm not giving it away, but I will be showing you photos later of his parents. So um, it's extraordinary, but he wasn't the only one. There were a number of them who would find about a sister or a relative somewhere. And so when the war ends, um, these guys, they're looking at their fellow British soldiers who like the war is over, they get to go home, they get to have a nice meal, they get to go back to their jobs, they get to see their wives. For, the, for many of these men, the war only start, really starts when the war ends because now they have to go find if there's any family letter members left. And at this point, like I said, they're so crucial in the war effort that the minute war is over, the British military says, we're gonna use these guys for the denazification efforts. So like I said, the story, like every chapter of the book honestly should be its own book because then I have this whole thing about them being at the forefront of the denazification efforts, capturing and killing, not capturing Nazis, sorry, not killing them at this point, interrogating them. They were the guys who, ca who, who got all that material for the Nuremberg trials, the same group of men.
Yeah, what, you want to go ahead and go to the pictures now? Yeah, let me go to the pictures if that's okay before we do some photos. So you'll have to screen share. I'm glad I haven't lost you in this weather. So I'm just going to sort of talk. These are so I'm going to like I said, the book has has like 50 to 100 photos in it, but these are just some that highlight some of the stories we've been talking about. Um, so that's the American cover of the book. As Mike said, please do purchase it because this is our last week in bookstores because um, that's how bookstores work unless people start continue to purchase it, it's, it's doing fine. So that's the only group photo we have of the X troop. That's not all of them, but that's them in Wales. And that's their um, commanding officer lying behind the bulldog in the front row, that's Brian Hilton Jones. And then all the men I've talked about are, are standing there, but there was, a, there was about 87 of them in total. Later they added more, but the original group was about 87. Next, please. Um, that's Paul Streeton, who is on that first raft landing at Sicily. And I, I always like this photo because he ends up after the war. I'm sure a number of you, when I say the name Paul Streeton, well, your ears will perk up because he becomes most one of the most important economists in the world. And I was able to interview him for this book before he unfortunately passed away um, last year. This is the um, best of the internment camps, the one Isle of Man. Um, but like I said, the worst of the um, internment camps were the ones in Australia and in Canada. And a lot of the ex-troopers were interred in Canada and Australia. Next, please. So that's Peter Masters, the um, artist from Vienna, who, like I said, after the war, has an incredible life as an artist. I just love this photo. His son shared it with me. Um, and that's him in the Pioneer Corps. And that's basically all they're allowed to do is move, you know, move wood and work on roads and feel so frustrated. But the good part about the Pioneer Corps is that they're really developing their English language. So the, at the point at which they go to Wales, they start to be able to hide their accents better. But it's funny, the Welsh, um, the Welsh all knew this was a strange group of men. One of them said to Miriam Rothschild, um, these men were so polite. And Miriam Rothschild, who was with them for a while because she was married to George Lane, said, unlike other soldier, soldiers, um, unlike other soldiers who, you know, would be drinking and smoking, these boys were spending their time talking about Schopenhauer. So this was the, this was the, and this was just a great photo of them in the Pioneer Corps. Next, please. That's Miriam Rothschild, who I talk about a lot in the book, who was married to George Lane, um, because she was doing all this intelligence work at the same time with Bletchley Park, which is where they were doing the decoding of the German um, messages. Next, please. That's the great Brian Hilton Jones, who, like I said, many of these men lost their parents in war, and he ends up being a, an extraordinary father figure to them. And when I wrote the book, I interviewed a second um, still living commando and I went and interviewed him and an amazing, amazing man. He unfortunately died a few months ago as well. And the most precious thing he shared with me was the letter of recommendation from Brian Hilton Jones. So he, he became their dad, but he took really good care of them. And after the war, the, it was very hard to get these men naturalized. That's a whole nother story, but he was fighting to get them naturalized after the war. Next, so there, please. there are no uh, surviving ex troopers at this point. Unfortunately, as as of two months ago, there are no, not that I know of. No, um, that is Klaus Asher, who becomes Colin Anson um, when the plane flies overhead, whose dad was killed at Dachau and who ends up landing at Sicily and has an amazing narrative arc about going from someone pretty shy and scared to being a really mighty warrior. And extremely handsome, if I'm mad, too. Next, please. And that's training, uh, training with full packs, jumping from airplanes, and everything else. In Wales, they did a lot of mountain climbing as well. Next, please. That's the great, great George Lane, the one who basically allowed um, D-Day to happen as planned, married to Miriam Rothschild. And the other um, ex-troopers called him the Hungarian hunk. Um, because they thought he was so handsome and capable. Um, and he's the one who has the tea with Rommel that I start the book with. Next, please. That's the great Peter Masters, um, like the one we had earlier in the Pioneer Corps, the Viennese um, artist uh, Jew, and that's him in his commando um, outfit. Next, please. 
that's um, the bicycle troop landing at D-Day. And you can see them sort of towards the back carrying these foldable, terrible bikes. Um, but it did get them to Pegasus Bridge first. Next, please. That's Marie Slatimer. When I talked about Dieppe, that the, one of them comes back, um, that's him on the right. And that's when they're at Wall Karen, where ex troopers are basically crucial for um, getting this island that allows them to get the port of Antwerp to continue the war. But why this is probably my favorite photo in this book. Um, and this is something Peter Master said about it that I just want to highlight here. So we all know that iconic photo, that terrible iconic photo of the little Jewish boy with his hands in the air with the yellow star and the German, the Nazis pointing their guns at him. And as Peter Masters pointed out, this is the wonderful opposite of it. We have a, a Jew holding his machine gun, pointing them at the Nazis. So I love this photo because I just feel like, damn, these boys, man, look at that. You know, they, they, they did it, right? Next, please. That's Ian Harris, who I haven't even talked about, one of the other heroes of the war. Um, you'll have to read about him because he's, he's a crazy hard man, amazing man. And this is after he single-handedly talks an entire German platoon into surrendering into him, to him by himself in Osnabrück. And that's him in the Jeep, driving the Jeep with the mustache, with his beret. Um, and it was so iconic a photo. It was shown all around the world after the war in newsreels. Next, please. That's Monfred Gans, the one I talked about who was Orthodox. And then during the war, he, he took the name Fred Gray and became Monfred Gans afterwards, the one who heard about his parents um, in the concentration camp. Next, please. And so you'll read the book to see how he does it, but um, there he is with his parents after the war in Israel and with his two brothers. It's such a beautiful photo. Next, please. And that is the great Ian Gilbert, who was at the forefront of the denazification efforts, going around um, formerly Nazi Germany with his pistol, rounding up and capturing uh, Nazis after the war. Next, please. And that's Ian Harris again, the guy who was in the Jeep with his family, uh, sorry, after he captured the entire uh, troop at Osnabrück. Next, please. And that's the British cover for the book because I know we get some British people. So you can also get it um, there. They did a slightly different cover. So those are all the photos um, I have, but there's way, way more of them in the book. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Brian Hilton Jones was not Jewish, correct? He was not Jewish. He just, he just was, he was the best. He was the, as all the men would say after the war, and this was actually unusual in, in the British military at this time. He was the one commanding officer. He would never do anything he wouldn't, he would never have his men do anything he wouldn't do first. So when he was training them, if he wanted them to jump out of the airplane, he would jump first. So they just admired and loved him. And he, like I said, he was a father figure and he took really, really good care of them. Oh, so what about some of the post-war experiences? Where did these guys end up? Okay, so after the war, the majority of them stay in the UK and the majority of them keep their names and many of them raise their kids Church of England and become those men they were um, during training. Um, those who don't stay in the UK emigrate to the United States and to Canada. Um, a few of them return to Australia and some of them who are sent to Germany, uh, a handful of them remain in Germany to work uh, like for decades with the German government to try and clean everything up there. But most of them remain in the UK or come to the States. Yeah, you write in, in the, uh, the end of the book about controversy, I don't know if that's the right word, about whether or not to include the word Jewish on the monument that's created for these guys. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'll talk about that. Um, and I see everyone keeps asking about the book. Um, it's on Amazon or wherever. And I think Mike probably has copies here, but anyway. Yeah, well, we'll have copies in the store and, and we can send out links uh, in a follow-up email to everyone to, to buy the book, but you should be able to get it. It's clearly on Amazon, yeah. really wherever books are sold. You yeah. Know? Ask um, your local bookstore to order it. Yeah, exactly. Shelf. So it says, um, but Amazon's good too, whatever. Um, so Look, in the 80s, um, the surviving commandos, a, a few of them who are in the UK decide that they're gonna create a monument to the X troop, which is fantastic. And it's gonna be where they trained in Wales, also wonderful. But 
um, the guys who are in charge of the sort of the memorial make the decision that the memorial will not say the word Jewish on it, even though at least 84 of the 87 men are Jewish. And their reasons are complicated. I write about in the book, but it ranges from we never told our families we were Jewish to we don't want to pick old wounds with the local Welsh, which suggests anti-Semitism. I mean, it's really problematic. Um, Manfred Gans, who I talked about, and Peter Masters, the artist, and Miriam Rothschild are the three fighting fiercely to have the word Jewish put on it, but they don't, they don't win in the end. However, so the monument is there. It does not mention that they're Jewish. There's a plaque there that does not mention that they're Jewish. And the local town council gives a, a, a pamphlet out to tourists that does not mention they're Jewish. However, there's a very fierce um, uh, British uh, Jewish veteran named Martin Sugarman, who's been fighting the Aberdeefe Town Council for 50 years about this. And he's encouraging people that when you go there to bring a Star of David and put it on the memorial. And there's been a lot of press about this book in the UK. So my hope is at some point the memorial will more publicly have the word Jewish in it. Because the reality is, as one of the sons of an ex-trooper said to me, he said, look, my dad may not have wanted the memorial to say explicitly that they were Jewish, but they were Jewish and that, and they fought as Jews who knew the clock was ticking, so. Uh, we have a question about this and I was curious myself, the three who were not Jewish, do we know much about their story, how they felt serving with the, serving with the other Jews? Uh, well, we, yeah, almost nothing about them. I think they kind of fell into the, 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 the troop and it was sort of like, we, they maybe needed someone who did something very specific. Um, and Brian Hilton jo Jones, of course, wasn't Jewish. And in none of his writing does he ever say the word Jewish, but he, I mean, he knew what was going on. And like I said, after the war, when the Polish troop is getting naturalized and the French troop is getting naturalized, the ex troop is not getting naturalized. And he fought fiercely for them because I think he knew what this was about. And it was only after a few years after parliament had to debate this, that the guys get their naturalization papers a couple of years after the war. Yeah, so that's something that's different within the US where there was this expedited naturalization yeah, process. Yeah, no. So. Mm. Hmm. But uh, I just wanna say one last point on that though. In all the interviews with the men, they rarely focused on the negatives of the Brits. What they overwhelmingly felt, I just should put this out there, was profound gratitude to the British for giving them arms and letting them fight. So I should say that, that they, the, the overwhelming feeling was not bitterness. It was intense gratitude that they got to go fight Nazis. I should imagine, I just see a, a message pop up in the chat from a Norman Gardner who says he's in Toronto where he's the commander of the Jewish War Veterans of Canada. And uh, they honored one of the ex troops in 2000 and he says he's still alive and well. Oh, then can you, ask, can you email me please? Because I've, yeah, uh, so many family uh, members. A lot of people think that people are an ex-troop and get it confused with the Jewish Brigade, which is different. But please do have them email me because okay, I've got yeah, we'll, we'll email. To get your yeah. Um, some, okay, let's get to some of the other questions in the Q and A. Uh, here's an early one. Uh, what was Churchill's role in interning the Jews? Uh, was the internment order after when he became prime minister? After he became prime minister. Unfortunately. Um, for me, I know many of us are divided on Churchill. I find Churchill a total hero and I'm a complete fan. This was a really bad moment in his history. He was the one who infamously said, call her the lot, which is the term for call her the lot. Um, and I think, you know, I think fact of the matter with the formation of the X troop is they probably realized pretty quickly that like they were locking up some of their best and their brightest. And um, so it was a bad moment. It was a terrible misstep. It was incredibly cruel and unfair. Um, and I think that sort of the ex troop was born out of that mistake. Uh, here, Sam Silverstein asked about uh, Enigma. Why was Enigma kept secret for so long after the war ended? I first saw a book in maybe the late 70s, 30 years after the war, and the same thing applies to the, your, the mission you described. Um, I think there's just a tradition of keeping completely silent about this stuff. I, I, I mean, so look, Miriam Rothschild was working on Enigma decoding, right? She's married to George Lane. When you read the Dieppe chapter, it really suggests that she probably had a hand in training these guys to go to Dieppe to try and get the machine. Her brother's really big in the SOS. So all of this stuff is happening at S, sorry, in the counterintelligence in the UK. Um, and it's really interesting. So when I was writing the Dieppe chapter, 
I con contacted Bletchley Park because I wanted to get all of her files because she plays a big role in my book. And honestly, I am so not a paranoid person nor a conspiracy person. But when I emailed Bletchley Park about just to even get the information on her, they emailed me back and said, we're sorry all the fi files have gone missing on Miriam Rothschild. So I don't know, I don't know. I mean, it's coming out. All of this stuff is gonna come out. I got a lot of it out. Whoever works on this troop after me will get more out. But it's just a, it's a, you know, a number of the personnel files of the men I write about were closed until like 20, 35 and I had to go to the war office to get them opened and get information about them. I think they just did this and you know, um, but we can get them declassified. Folks can get this stuff declassified now, most of it. Uh, Jim Lee Brightman asks, uh, were any of them captured? And, and, and I guess the follow up, what happened is they had the reap, they had they, as commandos that could be considered spies and they're Jews. So they're in danger on, on different levels than other soldiers. That's such a good question. Look, because these guys are at the forefront and their hands are always raised for the most dangerous missions and they have a very high mortality rate, um, more than half of them are either wounded or go missing in action or are killed. For those who are killed when the Brits know about it, like I said, they're buried under crosses. But I can tell you sort of typically what happens to them. So two of the men um, I thought when I was writing this book went missing in action at Dieppe. Like I said, five of them go over. Two of them are considered missing in action. I do a real deep archive dig and I find out that actually these two guys who we thought were missing in action were captured at Dieppe, right? And they have fake, like, like all of them do, nobody knows they're Jewish. They all have fake names and personas. And I find, again, by declassifying the files, I find this whole number of letters from MI5 about these two guys saying, have they, have they told who they really are? Have they given up their cover? Has anything come out about these guys? These two guys are kept in really terrible prisoner of war camps. And I have the whole paper trail and neither of them ever lets, let, shares the information of who they really are. They keep their cover the whole time. There's only a couple of men who just disappear without a trace. And my guess is I, maybe, I don't know, maybe the cover was was given, but I think most of them, as far as I know, um, like I said, they're buried under crosses or they're put in prisoner of war camps and nobody knows the real story. Uh, Stephen Sells asks, uh, any, any, any interactions with Ian Fleming's number 30 commando? Uh, Ian Fleming was connected to that rate of Yeah, right? no, so that's a very good question. So Ian Fleming was the one who trained all the guys in Dieppe to do the Enigma thing. And I had a lot of phone calls with O'Keefe who wrote the great book about this. Um, these guys were set as their, the, the three, the five X troopers were sent as their own special little separate thing to also try. They were, uh, they were with a different group. I don't know if they had any interactions with Fleming. That doesn't seem like they did. Um, they were sent again, through their, their own like separate little mission with a different commando unit to also try and assist in the snatching of the uh, Enigma. Uh, were any of the Jewish commandos awarded the Victoria Cross? Jim Bale. Oh, so that was another painful part of the story um, that because they weren't denaturalized for years, um, it actually had a profound impact on them. Um, they did not, George Lane and other, Ian Harris, the one who was in that Jeep, everyone felt he should have gotten the Victoria Cross when he got those thousands. But he didn't get the Victoria Cross for that. I mean, the military medal, he got it for, he did the Rhine crossing, Ian Harris, the guy in the Jeep before that, I'm sorry, after that, he does the Rhine crossing. And while he's fight, and then he does the Vesser um, river that he has to cross over. And he does hand-to-hand -hand combat with an entire unit of Hitler Jugend with his Tommy gun, fiercely killing, shooting, fighting all of these guys, he ends up getting wounded, he loses an eye, he gets his military medal citation, which literally says, I quote it in the book, I've never seen heroism like this guy, Ian Harris. He should have gotten the Victoria Cross, he didn't get the Victoria Cross. A number of them should have gotten medals that they didn't get, and as one of them said, during the denaturalization stuff that was happening, it was particularly painful because their wives for particularly those who were killed in battle would have gotten pensions and they didn't get them, so. Uh, let's see, Gerald Selman, how many died in action or were captured? 
Um, so of the original 87, more than half, of, uh, I think about 27 of them die. Um, a number of them are captured and a number of them are wounded. So more than half of them are either captured, killed or wounded. But they have later iterations. They do later training and bringing more men um, to, to keep the numbers up. Uh, let's see, Edward, Ed, Edward Epstein asked, any interest from Hollywood in making this into a movie? It's a great action story. Oh, well, for the first time in my life, I can say I have a movie agent, which is crazy. I mean, I'm like an academic mm -hmm. in New York City. Um, and we have had a, we've had some contact from people and I'm just hoping something happens because I, God, I want the world to know the story of these guys. And also I have to say, with all the anti-Semitism that's happening right now, of, of which I feel we're all dealing with, it is so awesome to have a story of Jews who are fighting back right now. So, you know, over the last few years, they've been a continual inspiration to me. And I feel like I want the broader world to know more about these, these boys who fought back like this. Uh, so speaking about movies, I have to ask the, the Inglorious Bastards uh, question that's been, I think I've seen, you know, a lot of reviews of the book. Everyone says, it is, you know, the real Inglorious Bastards. Uh, that's a movie people love and that people love the uh, depiction of Jewish empowerment, Jewish revenge, but it's also a uh, roving band of Jewish war criminals. Yeah. Uh, X Troop was different. Yes, so I have a lot to say on that. It, they hated that movie. The guy, some of the guys were still alive, and I read their letters. They hated it because I, I have to say, kind of say this real clearly. I mean, like the Daily Mail serialized my book, which was incredible in the UK, and I said you're never allowed to use the word revenge in my articles. And unfortunately, the the copy editor for the title said revenge, and I was like, oh, because these guys were not about revenge. They were all about following the rules of war, as they said over and over again, we are not like the Germans, we are different, we follow the rules of war. And I mean, in the most stark way, we get the story of Colin Anson, right? His dad's killed at Dachau. After the war, he's sent back to his hometown to do denazification efforts there. And he finds out who actually ratted him out and sent him to Dachau. And he, and he said, after the war, I could have taken that guy to the woods and I could have shot him, but I didn't do that because I'm not like that and we're not like that. And he turned him in. So when um, Inglorious Bastards came out, the guys felt pretty hurt by it. And Peter Masters' daughter, amazing woman, Kim Masters, she is a reporter for The Hollywood Reporter. And she wrote an incredible article saying my dad was the real Inglorious Bastards taking to task the Tarantino film publicly. Um, for its its completely misguided representation. Uh, Richard Kurtz, this is, we talked about this a little bit before. Uh, German Jews who served with the British paratroopers at Arnhem, Bridge Too Far, are buried under the Star of David at Osterbeck. The two names on their headstones, the cover British name, and their actual Jewish name. Why were these Jewish refugees more inclined to identify as Jewish than their ex troop brethren, and particularly the ones that stayed in England? Um, so the, the question of Jewishness is really complicated for them. By the way, I should add that Martin Sugarman, the guy who has been fighting to get the memorial change, has I, be, I email with him every day. Um, mm -hmm. We're working with a lot of the families to get the um, crosses changed to Star of David's. Not all of the families want that, but a lot of them do. So that's, that's in the works right there. It was so complicated. And when I think about it, look, I'm a parent, I have two kids and I understand it. I think that for many of these guys, even after being these fierce warriors, safety meant to assimilate, to acculturate, not to be too Jewish, maybe don't raise your kids as Jewish because you want to protect them. I think a lot of them felt intense gratitude and wanted to, you know, um, sort of be these warriors they became. But I also think a lot of them, look, their, their birth names were associated with the trauma, with the, their dead moms and stuff like that. And these guys all became adults, like 18 years old. They became adults at the moment they take on these new names. So I think also to be fair to them, they did become those men at that moment. That's who they became. That's why they were such good fighters. But it's not the case for all of them. Though those, most of those who emigrate to the United States raised their kids as Jewish and were kind of like proudly connected to that. But I think that for many of them in the UK, in, I don't know if it was subtle or overt, but there was pretty much a sense, I think for many of them, you could either be British or you could be Jewish and I'm going to be British. But here it's much easier to have a hyphenated identity, I think. 
Okay, we're gonna have to wrap up pretty soon. So let's just get to a couple more. And I apologize to the people we didn't get to your questions, uh, but we got one. This one from David Fry is members of X troop liberated Nazi occupied Europe and returned to Germany. Did they make distinctions between the German people and Nazis? Well, that's such a thank you, David. Hi, David. Um, so that's a great question. Look, it's so incredible. Manfred Gans, right? His denazification job is to go back to Bork in Germany, where he was raised, where he was brutalized as a Jew after the rise of Nazism, but he was really tough. He always fought back. And so when he gets back to Bork in Germany, it's incredible, but he knows who the anti-Semitic teachers are who tortured the Jewish kids. He knows who the mayor was who hid Jews, right? So again, this personal thing. So for him in the denazification efforts, he, he knew who he was guilty and he knew who was innocent and he did not make any, he did not think there was a difference between the Nazis and the Germans. He knew who did right and who did not do right. And I saw that over and over again with the denazification stuff. I mean, we know this about a number of others who did denazification efforts, but like Ron Gilbert, he was given a job to give out food cards to local Germans. He only would give them the card after making them watch um, films of the, the camps to see what these guys had done. So for most of them, um, they tried, I think, to have a forgiving heart. But I think for most of them who grew up in Germany and were brutalized by their schoolmates, um, again, it stayed quite personal for them. Let's, let's just end up with one more kind of factual one. What is the age and rank ranges of the ex troopers? So they came as a kinder transport, a lot of them, so they're young guys. Yeah, they're so sorry. What's that? So they're young guys. The, the, the range of the range of age and rank. The majority of the they start as privates. They go all the way up um, through captain. Like they get their um, their their commission rate was higher than uh, almost any other commando unit. Not that they got military medals, but that they they got commissions, especially on site commissions, which were very very rare. Most of them were really young. They were eighteen years old. One of the terrible stories I tell about is one of the older ones who um, who loses his wife and kids in Auschwitz during the war. But the majority of them were young and they were fight. And the majority of them felt, like I said, like they said over and over again in their diaries and interviews, it was the greatest thing in the world to get to do this. Like they, they were, they were, they weren't scared. They were like bring it on because I need to go find my sister. And Ron Gilbert, who I showed in that picture, who does denazification, once Paris is liberated, he goes to his commanding officer and says, give me a Jeep, I need to go find my sister who's in hiding. And again, another story in the book, and he does, and I have a photo of them as well. But they were young, they were really, really young, 18 years old. Hmm. Yeah, it's just remarkable stories. Yeah, and again, I want to encourage everyone uh, to go out and, and get the book. Let's see, I got my copy there. Mike. Um, I'll have some, uh, shortly I'll have some here in the museum store and we'll sell them here and we will send out follow-up links. Um, but Leah, do you still want to finish up with any final words? Um, yeah, what I want to end up saying, what I want to sort of finish on is that, you know, we have, we all know these stories. We all know very well about what the Germans did to the Jews, unfortunately. And we know so many stories about um, Jewish victims, but What's happening recently, which I think is extraordinary, is books like mine and others are coming to light about in every front where Jews could fight back, they did. I mean, my last book, Young Lions, which Mike talked about, I talk about the fact that in the United States, American Jews volunteered at a higher rate than any other group. Like Jews were there and they were ready. And man, when they were given the opportunity, like the ex-troop, they were absolutely crucial to the war effort. So it's really exciting to get to share this with, with everybody because I feel like this is another new important way to look at World War II.